Uh, my name is Curtis Smith. You know me from yesterday. I'm going to be speaking the last two hours, but our first speaker um, is also a fellow Michigander. Uh, this is going to be Sheila Wilhelm, and uh, Dr. Wilhelm is currently an associate professor within the Department of Pharmacy Practice at the Eugene Applebaum College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences at Wayne State University in Detroit. She received her doctor of pharmacy degree from the University of Michigan, followed by a pharmacy practice residency at Michigan Medical Center. Her current area of practice is adult internal medicine at Harper University Hospital in Detroit. And her teaching, scholarly, and patient care activity focus mainly on gastroenterology, primarily inflammatory bowel disease, as well as prevention and treatment of VTE and patient education. So welcome, Dr. Wilhelm. Okay, thank you for that introduction. Um, so for the next hour or so, we'll be going through gastroenterology and gastrointestinal disorders and their treatments. Um, I have nothing to disclose in relation to this presentation. Um, the learning objectives are on the next several slides, and they're basically reiterated from the workbook um, chapter that you um, have received. Essentially, we're going to be covering GI disorders that are commonly seen and their guideline-based recommendations for therapy. Um, so, like I said, the learning objectives are all here. There were several cases in the chapter, um, I think 12 cases, and I ch chose about seven of those to go over today. The way that I chose the cases that we'll be discussing um, is basically if there was new information regarding the treatment of those disease states, or if there was new information regarding the specific therapies used, um, or if it's a disease state that maybe is not as commonly seen in a general practice area so that we can review those together. We'll start with our first patient case, which is a 55-year-old man with an eight-month history of gastroesophageal reflux disease, or GERD. Um, he has this, these symptoms four to five days per week, and he's currently receiving lansoprazole 15 milligrams once daily by mouth. Um, based on an endoscopy exam, he has no evidence of erosions or ulcerations. His past medical history is the GERD as well as hypothyroidism. He's taking lansoprazole, 15 milligrams once daily, as well as levothyroxine, 100 micrograms daily. So as we go through the treatment of GERD, I want you to keep in mind um, what treatment approach would be best for this patient. Adding metoclopramide therapy four times a day, increasing his lansoprazole dose to 15 milligrams twice a day, switching his PPI to omeprazole daily, or adding sucralfate one gram four times a day. When we evaluate the treatment of GERD, um, there's a couple of things we can do. We generally start with non-pharmacologic therapy using targeted approaches. So there are several approaches we can use for non-pharmacologic therapy, but we really only want to choose the things that are appropriate for a patient specifically. Next, we would consider pharmacologic therapy, starting with antacids and moving on to anti-secretory therapy and acid suppression with proton pump inhibitors or histamine 2 receptor antagonists, or H2RAs. These can be dosed on an as-needed basis or on a scheduled basis, um, depending on the patient. If further evaluation is done and it's found that a patient has a GI motility issue, that's when we would consider adding a promotility agent. And as a last-line resort, we would consider surgical intervention. For the diagnosis of GERD, the guidelines recommend um, not doing an endoscopic study initially in most patients. If patients present with typical symptoms, it is reasonable to do an empiric treatment course with a PPI in order to um, evaluate whether there is a response to that. And if there is, that confirms the diagnosis of GERD. Um, in addition, screening for Helicobacter pylori is not recommended universally in patients with GERD symptoms, especially if they respond to that initial PPI therapy. The targeted non-pharmacologic therapies that we can try uh, if a patient is overweight at baseline or if they've recently gained a significant amount of weight, weight loss can help um, mitigate some of the symptoms of GERD. If a patient experiences nighttime symptoms, then elevating the head of the bed can be helpful, as well as avoiding meals within a couple of hours of the bedtime. Routine global elimination of food triggers is not recommended. If a patient has specific foods that they tie to their symptoms, we can target those, um, but global elimination is not necessarily um, helpful. 
The treatment approach for GERD, if a patient does have evidence of more severe disease, erosive esophagitis, an eight-week treatment course of a PPI is recommended. Um, there's really no major difference between the different PPIs as long as they're dosed appropriately. Um, they all have equivalent um, efficacy. If after this eight-week course a patient continues to have symptoms of GERD, it's, it's reasonable to continue the PPI use either, either on an as-needed or a scheduled basis. Um, in addition, if a patient experiences bedtime symptoms, you could consider adding an H2RA to the PPI therapy um, at bedtime. However, keeping in mind that over time the H2RA efficacy will decline with tachyphylaxis that develops. Again, like I said, before starting a prokinetic agent such as metoclopramide, we would want to do further testing to evaluate whether a, a motility disorder is actually present. As far as dosing the PPIs, um, traditionally we would dose them 30 to 60 minutes prior to the morning meal. Some of the newer PPIs offer some more flexibility with dosing, but routinely we'll see them dosed um, prior to a meal. If a patient is not responding appropriately to once a day PPI therapy, we have a couple of options. Probably the most commonly used um, option is increasing the dosing to twice daily PPI um, if, if a patient has partial or no response to their initial once daily therapy. Um, the other option is to um, switch PPIs and go from one to another. However, like I said, the efficacy is relatively similar across the PPIs, so we generally reserve switching PPIs for patients that have side effects that are not um, readily tolerated. So I said earlier that I chose the topics to include based on if there's new information about the therapy of um, of the disease state. With GERD, you can see that the treatment options really aren't that different from what we've had in the past. The one area that we do have newer information is our PPI safety concerns. We've traditionally thought of PPIs historically as being relatively safe medications. However, with prolonged use, we are seeing adverse effects that are showing up. Um, the first is the risk of fracture, and specifically in the hip, wrist, or spine. Um, this risk of fracture especially occurs with long-term use of PPIs. Um, all of, most of these adverse effects that we'll discuss are with long-term use. Um, one of the important things to consider is even though GERD therapy is supposed to be an eight-week course of therapy, there are some patients that will continue treatment either on their own because of the over-the-counter availability of these agents or because of continued symptomology that they require continued therapy. The concern for fractures shouldn't alter the decision to use a PPI if it is indicated for their disease states unless they have known risk factors for a major hip fracture. Patients with osteoporosis, if they're receiving adequate therapy for their osteoporosis, can remain on a PPI. Um, with all of these adverse effects, it's really important to evaluate the dose, make sure the patient's on the lowest effective dose, and the minimum length of duration of therapy. Ensuring that a patient receives adequate vitamin D and calcium supplementation is important. And really, bone mineral density screening is only appropriate if a patient has a risk for low bone mass um, aside from the PPIs. Hypomagnesemia has also been associated with PPI therapy. If this does develop, it's important, again, to reevaluate the need for a PPI therapy, limiting the dose and duration, as we saw with the hip fracture risk, um, in patients with underlying risk factors for low magnesium, such as diuretic therapy, or patients who are on digoxin therapy, for example, it would be reasonable to consider baseline magnesium testing um, for um, magnesium concentrations. However, it's not recommended that every patient on a PPI have that testing done. If hypomagnesemia occurs, it is reasonable to supplement with oral magnesium, and um, continuing the PPI is really based on the patient-specific factors. Clostridium difficile associated diarrhea or C. diff diarrhea is another um, risk, risk with PPI therapy. Again, reevaluating the need for PPI and limiting the dose and duration to the minimum appropriate um, is important to do. Letting patients know when we counsel them about the risk for this developing is important so that if they do develop diarrhea that is not improving or that is severe, that they do let their healthcare provider know so that they can undergo further testing and treatment if it's appropriate. Community-acquired pneumonia has been associated with PPI use, and unlike the other risk factors, um, community-acquired pneumonia is seen more frequently with um, short-term therapy, so early in the course of therapy. 
Uh, where this comes up is really when we think about our inpatients who receive a PPI, for example, for stress ulcer prophylaxis, we may be increasing their risk for community-acquired pneumonia in the short term. Um, we don't see the same association with long-term use of PPIs. Um, these risks are uh, discussed in the GERD guidelines, and there's a couple of other risks that have been um, published more recently, and that's uh, the risk for dementia and the risk for kidney disease. Uh, those still were waiting for additional data to really show a definitive link with PPI therapy, but there is some publications out there that you may run across in your um, reading. So going back to our patient with GERD, um, by a show of your cards, which treatment approach is best for this patient? Adding metoclopramide, 10 milligrams four times a day, increasing lanzoprazole to 15 milligrams twice daily, switching to omeprazole 20 milligrams daily, or adding sucrophate 1,000 milligrams four times a day. Okay, so I'm seeing a lot of B, um, so I agree that B would be the appropriate choice here. Like we said, he doesn't have um, evidence of GI dysmotility that would indicate needing metoclopramide therapy. Uh, switching to omeprazole could be reasonable if he was developing adverse effects to lanzoprazole, but probably not necessary for him in this case. And sucralfate doesn't really play a role in the treatment of GERD. Um, so increasing his dose to twice daily would be the most appropriate approach here. Our next case is a 42-year-old male with sharp epigastric pain for six weeks. His pain is worse with eating and is present approximately five days per week. He does experience some relief with over-the-counter antacids that he uses. His medications only include the antacids as needed. Um, he reports an allergy to sulfa medications with history of rash, and his urea breath test was positive for Helicobacter pylori or H. pylori. So thinking about this patient and which of the following treatments for H. pylori is best, amoxicillin, clarithromycin, and omeprazole for five days, cephalexin, clarithromycin, and omeprazole for 10 days, bismuth, tetracycline, metronidazole, and omeprazole for 14 days, or levofloxacin, metronidazole, and omeprazole for 10 days. So we just finished talking about GERD, and we're going to switch gears and talk about peptic ulcer disease. In peptic ulcer disease, the first thing we do is classify the disease based on location, whether a patient has a duodenal ulcer or gastric ulcer. Patients often present with um, typical symptoms of epigastric pain, nausea, anorexia, and belching that may be temporally related to food, which is what we saw in the patient that um, presented. The two main etiologies of peptic ulcer disease are NSAID-induced ulcers and H. pylori-induced ulcers. And we know that H. pylori, um, as a causative agent, is also a carcinogen. So if we do test for H. pylori and it comes back positive, we are obligated to treat that, um, to treat that uh, H. pylori. In order to determine if a patient is positive for H. pylori, we have a couple of different options um, for testing. We have a set of invasive tests that have to be completed through an endoscopic exam, and then we have some non-invasive testing that can be done using serologies or um, breath or fecal um, testing. The main thing I want you to take away from this slide is really the effect that anti-secretory agents or acid suppressive agents can have on the test results of these, um, of these various tests. So any of the tests that rely on urease enzyme activity of the H. pylori can be um, affected by anti-secretory agents and can result in a false negative test. It's important for any of those tests for the patient to discontinue any kind of anti-secretory products for two weeks prior to testing. And if those tests are being used to confirm eradication after a treatment course, um, we usually wait four weeks in order to reevaluate that patient. Uh, histology and culture are also options if you are doing an invasive test. However, these do have complications, and um, the culture, for example, takes a long time to grow. is very um, labor-intensive, so we don't routinely see that being done. The non-invasive testings are, are usually used most often. Uh, serology is very handy. It's a blood test looking for the IgG um, to Helicobacter pylori. However, one of the limitations with that is it can indicate either the presence of past H. pylori or current H. pylori. So it's not really useful to test for eradication of H. pylori if a patient has undergone treatment because they can remain positive on serologies for a good amount of time afterward. 
When we treat H. pylori, if it is found to be present, we have a couple of main approaches as our first-line therapies. The first is a triple therapy approach where we're using two different antibiotics along with the proton pump inhibitor. Um, the important thing with all of these therapies is, is that it's possible to switch out the PPI. Any of the PPIs would be reasonable to try in these therapies. However, the antibiotics really can't be switched out um, based on efficacy. These are the agents that are recommended in the treatment guidelines. So for triple therapy, it would be a proton pump inhibitor of your choice along with amoxicillin or metronidazole plus clarithromycin. Um, both triple and quadruple therapy are recommended for 10 to 14 days, with 14 days or the longer end of therapy being preferred for the higher amount of efficacy. Um, with the triple therapy, because it is a clarithromycin-based regimen, patients who have had prior exposure to macrolides may have lower eradication rates because of H. pylori resistance that's been developing to the macrolides. So that's something to keep in mind based on patient-specific factors that might lead you to try using a quadruple therapy as your first-line treatment of choice. Quadruple therapy includes, again, a PPI of choice. You can use any of them, along with bismuth, metronidazole, and tetracycline. Um, this would be first-line therapy in patients with a penicillin allergy who you wouldn't want to use amoxicillin in. Um, also in patients, like I said, with previous macrolide exposure and a concern for resistance to the clarithromycin. It can also be used as second-line therapy following a failure of triple therapy. Again, 10 to 14 days of therapy is recommended, with 14 days being preferred. There is a commercially available combination product on the market called Pylera that includes the bismuth, tetracycline, and metronidazole components of this um, therapy. And the nice thing with that combination product is it's uh, bismuth substitrate um, salt, and so you don't have to be concerned about patients with an aspirin allergy using the bismuth subsalicylate that we would ordinarily use. So going back to our patient case and looking at which one of the following treatments is best, we have amoxicillin, clarithromycin, and omeprazole for five days, cephalexin, clarithromycin, and omeprazole for 10 days, bismuth, tetracycline, metronidazole, and omeprazole for 14 days, or levofloxacin, metronidazole, omeprazole for 10 days. Okay, so I'm seeing a fair amount of green for C, and I would agree with you on that. Um, option A, amoxicillin, clarithromycin, and omeprazole, the drugs are appropriate, but the duration of therapy is not long enough at five days. Um, with the second option, cephalexin is not one of the... Um, proven effective antibiotics to use. And remember, we can only switch out the PPIs. We have to use the antibiotics as they are listed. So that would be inappropriate. And then D is a levofloxacin fluoroquinolone-based therapy regimen, which um, may be efficacious, but in the guidelines, it's really listed as a third or fourth line um, treatment option. So it would not be appropriate to use that as a first, first line option. Our next patient case is a 35-year-old male with mildly, mild to moderately active ulcerative colitis confined to the descending colon and the rectum. His past medical history includes ulcerative colitis and seasonal allergies, and his only medication is loratadine for his seasonal allergies. So with this patient, looking at which drug regimen is best at this time, our options are balsalazide, 750 orally twice a day, methotrexate 25 milligrams IM weekly, infliximab, 5 milligrams per kilogram IV, or mesalamine enema, 1 gram daily. When we look at patients with inflammatory bowel disease, the first thing we need to do is determine whether a patient has ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, the two types of IBD. Um, the main differences here I'll try to highlight from this table. Um, in ulcerative colitis, disease is really usually confined to the colon and the rectum potentially into the terminal ileum, but usually residing mainly in the colon. Whereas in Crohn's disease, it can affect anywhere within the GI tract from the mouth to the anus. Um, the depth of the lesions is also different between the two, where ulcerative colitis tends to have more superficial lesions, and Crohn's disease, the lesions tend to go deeper into the submucosa and through the bowel wall. And because of that, in Crohn's disease, you'll see more... Um, more bowel wall complications such as fistula, perforations, and strictures that you wouldn't see in ulcerative colitis. One of the other differences is the pattern of inflammation. In ulcerative colitis, you have a continuous pattern of inflammation, 
where um, the inflammation is confined to a specific area in the GI tract, whereas in Crohn's disease, you can have areas of inflammation um, interspersed with areas of healthy tissue followed by areas of inflammation with a discontinuous and patchy type of picture. Um, patients with ulcerative colitis in the long term have a higher rate of colorectal cancer developing, whereas that's not what we see generally in Crohn's disease. So those are some of the main differences between the two types of um, inflammatory bowel disease. Once we've identified which the patient is, um, which which type the patient has, the next step is to identify the severity of the disorder. Some patients will be in remission and not have any active symptoms versus other patients with active disease. There are several um, rating scales that are available based on patient-specific symptoms and global assessment, as well as um, scores based on scopes that a patient has undergone. undergone. Um, and from that, we can determine whether a patient has mild disease, moderate disease, severe, or fulminant disease. The next thing to determine is where the disease is located, because that can help us determine which type of therapy and which route of therapy is most appropriate. Extensive disease would include large components of the large bowel, and then left-sided disease would be anything from the splenic flexure down, and then rectal disease would be confined just to the rectal area. When we have all of these components figured out, the next step is to pick appropriate drug therapy. Some of the things we look at are the onset of action of the drug therapy. If a patient is experiencing acute symptoms, we want something that will help um, institute or induce remission immediately for that patient. The formulation can play a role, whether it's an oral or systemic type of treatment, a parenteral type of treatment, or topical therapy for people who have distal disease that we can reach with an enema or a suppository. The effectiveness of the therapy has to be considered as well as potential adverse effects or contraindications specific to that patient. So when we break down ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, you see that the treatments are relatively similar across the two. When we look at patients with mild to moderately active disease, again, we're breaking it down based on where the disease is located in that patient. For extensive disease, we're really going to go for more of a systemic therapeutic approach, so an oral aminosalicylate or oral budesonide. Remember, oral budesonide is a corticosteroid that undergoes a large amount of hepatic first-pass metabolism, so we don't see a lot of the same um, systemic adverse effects that we would see with something like prednisone or methylprednisolone. So it's a very attractive option that really has efficacy within the GI tract with limited um, systemic adverse effects. These can be used um, with or without addition of topical therapy. If a patient has some component of distal disease, that can be helpful um, to help alleviate the symptoms more quickly. In patients with left-sided disease from the splenic flexure down, um, we can consider using an enema, which will penetrate up to the splenic flexure in the GI tract. And then for patients with rectal disease, we can use um, simply a suppository, either a mesalamine suppository or um, a steroid-type suppository to induce remission in those patients. Patients with moderate to severe disease require a little bit more, um, a little bit more with their therapy. One of the options we have are the tumor necrosis factor alpha inhibitors. So that would be things like infliximab and adalimumab, galimumab, and sertilizumab. Um, they can be used in combination with or um, in combination with other agents or alone. Azathioprine and 6-mercaptopurine are often used for both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. With these agents, we have to keep in mind that their onset of action is quite long and can um, be two to three, up to six months um, to see their full efficacy. So these really are agents that we use for maintenance of remission rather than induction of remission. In Crohn's disease, you can also use methotrexate, although the data with ulcerative colitis are really not that great, so we don't often use methotrexate in ulcerative colitis. Corticosteroids can be used um, systemically for short-term therapy, but we try to avoid using them in the long term because of their adverse effect profile. And then last line, we do have the integrin inhibitors. Vetalizumab is the new kid on the block, and natalizumab has been around a lot longer um, and is associated with some adverse effects that we want to be careful of. So the key concerns with IBD treatment and adverse effects we want to watch for with the TNF-alpha inhibitors, if you remember, they um, are associated with increasing the risk of infection, especially um, reactivation of latent infections, things like TB or viral hepatitis. It's important to evaluate a patient for the presence of those before initiating um, a TNF-alpha inhibitor. 
They can also induce or worsen heart failure. Um, they are also, infliximab is also associated with hepatosplenic T-cell lymphoma, and that's especially when used in combination with, azoth- with azathioprine or 6-mercaptopurine, and especially in young male patients is where we saw it the most in the trials that we have. Antibody formation with infliximab is a concern because of its murine component. It's a chimeric antibody. So um, those antibodies that form can actually increase the risk for infusion-related reactions. Um, We do see some benefit if patients develop this of switching them to a humanized monoclonal antibody, any of the other ones that are available, um, and that can alleviate some of that issue. Anti-motility agents are not generally used in this population, but if you do have a patient with excessive diarrhea, you may see them being used. Um, The concern is in ulcerative colitis, using anything that slows down the GI tract can increase the risk of toxic megacolon, which is a life-threatening emergent situation. Azathioprine and 6-mercaptopurine, as you know, is associated with bone marrow suppression, pancreatitis, and hypersensitivity. Um, They are metabolized through the thiopurine methyltransferase enzyme, and so activity of um, TPMT has to be checked prior to beginning these treatments. If a patient has low to absent activity, that may preclude the use of these agents um, or may require a significant dose reduction. And like we said, lymphoma can occur when combined with um, infliximab, the TNF-alpha inhibitor. Methotrexate, which we said is really only used in Crohn's disease patients, is also associated with bone marrow suppression, pulmonary and hepatic toxicity, and really shouldn't be used in pregnant patients. Corticosteroids, especially longer term, are associated with adrenal suppression, metabolic effects, infection risk. Again, we try to use those for a very limited amount of time to induce remission and then switch to something else to maintain that remission. Natalizumab, the integrin inhibitor that we've had for a while, Um, is associated with a rare adverse effect, uh, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, or PML, which is a fatal adverse effect. So um, to use natalizumab, the physician prescribing it as well as the patient have to be registered in um, in a restricted use program. Vetalizumab is the new integrin inhibitor, and the data we have so far um, doesn't indicate that it's associated with PML development. However, it is relatively new on the market, so we don't have a lot of post-marketing data to know what the long-term outcomes are. The data from the studies we have go out to about a year, so um, from what we've seen in in that patient population, we haven't seen the development of PML. So getting back to our patient, remember this patient had left-sided ulcerative colitis. Um, We want to know which drug regimen is best at this time. We can start valsalazide, 750 PO twice a day, methotrexate, 25 milligrams IM weekly, infliximab, 5 milligrams per kilogram IV, or mesalamine enema, 1,000 milligrams daily. Okay, so I'm seeing a mix, but mostly yellow. So I would agree with the mesalamine enema for this patient. Remember, left-sided disease, anything from the splenic flexure distal, um, can be affected with topical therapy using an enema. Um, Topical therapy, generally, we see faster onset and more efficacy than we see with systemic or oral therapy, so we really try to go that route if possible. Um, Belsalazide is an oral aminosalicylate, so that could be an option. However, you're not going to see the same efficacy that you would with a topical regimen. Methotrexate, again, really has no place in ulcerative colitis. It would be reserved for a Crohn's disease situation. And infliximab would be reserved for patients with more severe disease that require um, more broad therapy, such as infliximab. So switching gears, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the complications of cirrhosis. And just as a reminder, there are a lot of complications of cirrhosis that can contribute to the morbidity and mortality of of liver disease. Things like encephalopathy, ascites, hepatorenal syndrome, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, and variceal bleeding. Um, This disease state could fill up an entire hour easily on its own. Um, So we're going to focus on one aspect of the complications of liver disease. This is a 56-year-old man who's admitted with a two-day history of confusion, disorientation, somnolence, and reduced oral intake. On exam, he's afebrile with abdominal tenderness, reduced reflexes, dry mucous membranes, and asterixis. Past medical history is cirrhosis and alcohol abuse, and he's currently receiving propranolol, 40 milligrams, three times a day. Um, He receives a paracentesis, which is found to be negative for infection. 
So looking at what treatment is best for this patient, we can consider rifaximin, 550 milligrams orally twice a day, lactulose, 30 milliliters orally every two hours, polyethylene glycol, 17 grams orally twice a day, or ceftriaxone, one gram IV once a day. So this patient was presenting with hepatic encephalopathy. And when we look at hepatic encephalopathy, we have a number of ways that we can classify it. Um, we can subtype it based on the underlying etiology, um, type A being due to acute liver failure, type B due to portosystemic bypass or shunting, and type C due to cirrhosis. We can also look at the duration of the encephalopathy to further classify it from there. Uh, patients with episodic encephalopathy would have an acute episode. Patients with recurrent encephalopathy would have a second episode within at least uh, within six months or less of the previous episode. And then patients with persistent encephalopathy have a chronic baseline altered mental status or behavioral changes um, that can then have overt episodic encephalopathy on top of that as an acute on chronic type of picture. So our patient would fall more in the episodic um, type of encephalop encephalopathy. When we further grade the encephalopathy, we have a couple of approaches. We have the West Haven criteria, which grades it based on severity, and then the Aishan criteria grade it based on covert or overt encephalopathy. Covert encephalopathy um, generally means that a patient has some changes in their mental status and behavior. However, it's not significant enough to alter their activities of daily living and their um, general functioning and well-being. Overt encephalopathy would be anything grade two and above in the West Haven criteria and can be anything from lethargy, some confusion that affects their daily living, the presence of asterixis, and can um, go from there all the way up to coma in the most severe situations. So in patients with episodic overt hepatic encephalopathy, we have a couple of things that we do in order to try and manage their symptoms. The first and most important thing to do is really to try and identify any precipitating factors and remove or treat them if possible. Um, infection can cause precipitation of hepatic encephalopathy as well as other medications that may be being used to treat other comorbid conditions, electrolyte disturbances, the presence of constipation or bleeding, especially variceal bleeding um, that would be going into the GI tract. Our, still, our mainstay of therapy is lactulose therapy. It's easy to administer. It results in a very rapid ammonia reduction from the systemic circulation um, and oftentimes results in clearing of the mentation to a good degree. We would generally titrate the dose of lactulose to achieve between two and four loose bowel movements per day. And it can be used in the acute setting to clear mentation initially, and it can also be used as maintenance therapy to prevent future episodes of um, encephalopathy. Rifaximin is a non-absorbable antibiotic agent, which has similar efficacy to lactulose. Its main role currently is um, add-on preventative therapy after the first or multiple episodes of encephalopathy. So it can be used either alone as maintenance therapy or added to the lactulose therapy um, as necessary, but usually reserved for more of a maintenance phase rather than the acute phase um, that patients present in. Neomycin and metronidazole are other antibiotics that have been used in um, the treatment of encephalopathy. We just have to keep in mind with neomycin that it's a minimally absorbed aminoglycoside agent um, when you administer it orally. However, there is still some absorption and there's a concern for renal dysfunction development as an adverse effect. Especially in our um, liver patients, we want to really make sure to protect their renal function so that we don't give them additional risk factors for developing hepatorenal syndrome. So with the use of neomycin, we want to make sure to use the lowest effective dose for the shortest period of time um, if we do end up using that in their therapy. So going back to our patient and his um, overt episodic hepatic encephalopathy, um, which treatment would be best? Rifaximin 550 orally twice a day, Lactulose, 30 milliliters orally every two hours. Polyethylene glycol, 17 grams orally twice a day. Or ceftriaxone, one gram IV once daily. All right, so I see a lot of red. So B, um, like we said, lactulose still is our first line agent, especially in the acute setting. Um, rifaximin could be added to the lactulose if we need additional therapy in a maintenance type of situation to prevent future episodes. 
Polyethylene glycol actually does have some evidence for use in encephalopathy. However, more often than not, the dosing is the four liters over four hours dose rather than the 17 gram dose. Ceftriaxone would be appropriate to treat spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, but as we saw, this patient's paracentesis was negative for infection. The next case is a 45-year-old woman with a history of IV drug abuse, diagnosed eight months ago with hepatitis B virus. She is treatment naive. She has no ascites or signs of encephalopathy. Her serum creatinine is normal at 0.9. Her INR is slightly elevated at 1.3. Her albumin is normal at 3.9. Her AST and ALT are significantly elevated at 650 and 850 and her hepatitis B surface antigen is positive, as well as her hepatitis B E antigen is positive. She also has the presence of a YMDD mutation. The hep B viral load is, um, or the DNA is 107,000, and her liver biopsy shows severe necroinflammation and bridging fibrosis. So in this case, uh, what would be the most appropriate course of action? either no treatment and recheck the hep B viral DNA in six months, initiate pegylated interferon plus ribavirin, initiating lamivudine 100 milligrams a day, or initiating tenofovir 300 milligrams a day. So hepatitis B is a DNA virus with several genotypes, A through H. Um, We don't routinely check the genotype of hepatitis B because we don't currently have enough data to support switching therapy based on the genotype in this situation. As a reminder, the transmission of hep B is usually parenteral through bodily fluids, through sexual contact, or uh, perinatal transmission. We generally diagnose based on serologies, and patients that present with symptoms suggested of hepatitis B or elevated liver function tests uh, would warrant serology testing. Patients with active disease um, will be hepatitis B surface antigen positive, which is what we saw with our patient case. As far as who we offer treatment to, we generally are looking at patients with chronic disease of six months or more, as well as patients with um, greater than two times the upper upper limit of normal of ALT, as well as hepatitis B virus DNA of greater than 20,000 copies. Once we determine that a patient has hep B and we want to look at therapy, we need to distinguish if the virus is E antigen positive or negative. This has implications for the duration of the course of therapy, um, less so on the choice of therapy, but more so on the duration. We also need to know if the patient harbors the YMDD mutation of the DNA polymerase. The presence of this mutation confers um, resistance to lamivudine and may affect our therapy choices um, and trying to avoid lamivudine therapy. There are a few difficult patient populations to treat based on um, potential for reduced efficacy. And that would be t- patients with decompensated liver disease, patients with co-infection, for example, with HIV, or patients who have already undergone treatment and have either discontinued therapy or have failed therapy and now are representing for um, a second course of therapy. So when we look at treatment options for hepatitis B, um, again, this table is broken up into hep B, E antigen, positive or negative patients. The treatment choices are the same. It's really the treatment duration that differs. Uh, The presence of the E antigen really denotes ongoing active viral replication. So as you would anticipate, patients that have the E antigen may be more susceptible to um, treatment and so would require potentially lower or shorter durations of treatment compared to somebody who doesn't have the E antigen present. Um, Currently, we try to use oral oral agents when at all possible. Um, Intacavir and tenofovir are preferred oral agents at this time. Um, There are other uh, antivirals that we can use. Lamivudine was one that I mentioned. Uh, Another option is using interferon therapy. Um, We can either use non-pegylated interferon, but more often than not, pegylated interferon is preferred for ease of dosing and um, overall tolerability compared to the non-pegylated. Like I said, the duration differs, so you can see with the positive, um, E E antigen positive patients, the durations tend to be shorter than what you see with the E antigen negative um, hepatitis B. As far as the adverse effects go for our antiretro or for our um, antiviral therapy, rebound hepatitis upon discontinuation can be seen. 
uh, GI adverse effects, which can affect tolerability, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. Patients with co-infection of HIV, depending on the therapy we choose, um, can affect HIV resistance down the road. Rarely we may see the development of lactic acidosis, as well as reductions in bone mineral density. Um, Adefavir is associated with nephrotoxicity, so that's something to keep in mind if that's part of a patient's regimen. And then telbivudine has been associated with elevations in CK as well as peripheral neuropathy development. Um, Most of these agents do require renal dose adjustment, so knowing your patient's renal function up front is very important to appropriately dose their medications. So looking at our patient again, um, what is the most appropriate course of action at this time? No treatment and recheck HBV um, DNA in six months. Initiate PEG interferon with ribavirin. Initiate lamivudine 100 milligrams a day. Or initiate tenofovir 300 milligrams a day. Okay, so I'm seeing mostly yellow, so D. Um, I would agree with that. Uh, this, it would not be appropriate to not treat this patient. She does have evidence of chronic disease, having been diagnosed eight months ago, and having elevated liver enzymes and um, liver biopsy results indicating fibrosis. Uh, pegylated interferon alone could be an option. Um, however, when it's used with ribavirin, that's how we historically have treated hepatitis C, and ribavirin doesn't really have a place in hepatitis B treatment. Lamivudine would be not appropriate based on her YMDD uh, mutation and making her less, um, making it have less efficacy for her. Tenofovir would be our optimal option in this situation, and then entecovir could be an alternative option based on the primary treatment options that are recommended. Case number six, this is a 38-year-old male with chronic hepatitis C of genotype 1A with compensated disease. He's not currently on any, on any medications, and he has no known drug allergies. His labs include elevated AST and ALT at 350 and 420, respectively, and his hepatitis C RNA is 950,000. His serum creatinine is normal at 1, his hemoglobin is 12, and his white count is also 12. He has the presence of an NS380QK polymorphism, and his liver biopsy is reported to have a Metavir score of F3A2, which indicates um, fibrosis in the, li- in the liver. So in this patient, we're going to be evaluating the appropriate course of action, whether we should reassess in 12 months, initiate sofosbuvir and semeprovir, initiate sofosbuvir and lidipasvir, or initiate pegylated interferon, ribavirin, and sofosbuvir. So this is one of the disease states that I included because the therapy has changed a great deal in the last few years. And even between the time that I submitted these slides and now, there's been new therapies that have been approved that haven't quite come to the market yet. So it's an area of huge amounts of changes um, to keep in mind. Hepatitis C, unlike Hep B, is an RNA virus with genotypes 1 through 6. Genotypes 1 through 3 are most commonly seen in the U.S., and genotype 1 tends to be the most resistant to drug therapy. Unlike hepatitis B, we do genotype hepatitis C virus in order to determine the most appropriate therapy choice. As far as testing for hepatitis C, any patient with behaviors or exposures that are associated with um, hepatitis C virus risk would be appropriate to test for the presence of the virus. As far as treatment goes, this is also an area that has changed in the most current guidelines. Historically, we used to classify patients based on whether they should be high priority to receive treatment or not. Um, Currently, any patient with hepatitis C um, chronically should receive therapy unless they have a short life expectancy that cannot be remedied by treating the hepatitis C or some other comorbidity that they have. So most all patients with chronic hep C should receive treatment at this time. Our treatment goals are threefold. First, we want virologic cure, uh, which we equate with sustained virologic response, and that's defined as undetectable hep C virus RNA 12 weeks following treatment. This is correlated with a treatment cure in up to 99% of patients, so our current therapies are very effective. Um, We also want to reduce all-cause mortality as well as liver-related adverse outcomes, such as end-stage liver disease and hepatocellular carcinoma. So like I mentioned earlier in the past, interferon and ribavirin were really the backbone of therapy. Currently, those really aren't recommended for treatment options 
Um, we do have uh, several direct acting antivirals that work at different points in the replication of the um, hep C virus. We have NS34A inhibitors, we have NS5A inhibitors, and NS5B inhibitors. So we'll go through some of these agents so that you can see um, how they work or where they work. Semepervir is the first agent we'll talk about. This is an NS34A protease inhibitor. Um, it's approved, like all of these, for the treatment of hep C infection as a component of a co combination antiviral medic or regimen. So it's important that we're not using monotherapy. We're using these all in combination in order to most effectively treat the virus. It's approved for treatment of genotypes 1 and 4 by the FDA. However, in the guidelines, it's currently really recommended for genotype 1 um, therapy. The dose is a 150-milligram capsule once daily with food, and it's really only recommended in patients with a creatinine clearance greater than 30 milliliters per minute. Many of these agents don't have dosing recommendations for creatinine clearance below 30 milliliters per minute, so that's an area where more data is needed in order for us to be able to treat those patients that have renal insufficiency. The efficacy of all of these agents is relatively good with 80 to 90% SVR rates for semepervir. So remember the sustained viral response is at 12 weeks following therapy, we want undetectable um, HCV. Considerations for semepervir, the presence of the NS3Q80K polymorphism in patients with genotype 1A um, really indicates reduced efficacy of semepervir. So if that's present, we really try and avoid semepervir use if possible. Um, also, patients that might experience less efficacy include those of East Asian ancestry, patients with moderate to severe underlying liver disease, um, or patients that have drug interactions with um, CYP3A inducers or inhibitors. We may need to either monitor or change um, concurrent therapy in order to avoid those interactions. All of these agents are generally well tolerated, especially when you consider them in comparison to our old interferon ribavirin therapy. Um, adverse effects include rash, photosensitivity, fatigue, and anemia. The next drug we have is Sofosbuvir, or Sovaldi is the brand name. This is an NS5B um, inhibitor. It's approved, again, for the treatment of hep C in combination with other antivirals. For genotypes 1 through 4 and potentially 5 and 6, which we'll talk about in just a second, um, you can also treat patients with he uh, hepatocellular carcinoma or HIV co-infection with uh, sofosbuvir. So in the guidelines, if you've seen them, they have different sections for patients with other comorbidities, such as um, HCC or HIV co-infection. The dosing, again, is once daily with or without food. It's a 400-milligram tablet. And similar to the semepervir, it's really only indicated for patients with good renal function with creatinine clearance above 30. The efficacy is very good for genotypes 1, 2, and 4. It kind of drops off with genotype 3. We see a 60 to 71% SVR rate in that genotype, so that's something to consider when choosing therapies if something else is available that would work better for that patient with genotype 3. Other considerations, sofosbuvir is sometimes used in combination with ribavirin for certain genotypes. So in those situations, it's important to evaluate the ribavirin dose and adjust it for um, hemoglobin changes and cardiac disease presence. Also, the use of potent P-glycoprotein inducers or anticonvulsants can alter the efficacy of sofosbuvir due to drug interactions, as well as the presence of cirrhosis, or if a patient has had prior treatment, both of those can also reduce the efficacy of the, the treatment. Adverse effects include fatigue, headache, and nausea, so again, relatively well-tolerated agent. Um, I'm sure you've heard of Harvoni, which is the combination of sofosbuvir and letopasvir, and so that's um, a combination product in one tablet. Uh, letopasvir is a nucleoside uh, NS5A inhibitor. It's approved for treatment of hep C genotypes 1, 4, 5, or 6, in combination with the sofosbuvir. Um, most patients that receive this combination require 12 weeks of therapy. There is an extended um, duration of therapy in patients with cirrhosis of 24 weeks. Again, the dosing is just one tablet once a day with or without food, and because the sofosbuvir component is there, it's really only indicated for patients with creatinine clearances greater than 30. 
Um, the next agent we have is the Vicara pack, which is a, also a combination product. Um, this is indicated in genotype 1 infection with or without compensated cirrhosis. So for some of our more complicated patients, they can use this as well. Um, there are three components in one tablet, and then there's a separate tablet of um, Dizabuvir. So the Paratepravir um, is a boosted with the ritonavir component of the combination product, and then Ombatasavir is the third component of the um, combination tablet. Dizabuvir is dosed twice daily, and so that's why it's not included in the combination product. Again, it can be used with or without food, similar to the other agents we looked at. Fatigue, nausea, and pruritus are commonly seen. We want to avoid in child pew class C liver disease because we do see reduced efficacy in those patients. And then it is pregnancy category B, so it is something to consider if you do have a patient who is pregnant. Um, so there are some major drug interactions to be aware of, CYP3A4 substrates and inhibitors, as well as CYP2C8 substrates and inhibitors. Um, are things to watch out for with these agents. So really, anytime you're using any of these antivirals, it's really important to evaluate the full patient drug therapy to determine whether significant drug interactions are present. Um, it is contraindicated, concurrently used with ethanol estradiol. It's important to discontinue the estradiol prior to the use of the Vicuripac and um, check the ALT within the first four weeks of treatment in order to make sure that nothing um, is interacting adversely. Uh, Daclatasvir is also one of the newer agents. This is a nucleotide NS5A inhibitor. It's approved in the treatment of genotypes one or three. Um, it can be combined with sofosbuvir with or without ribavirin. Its dose is 60 milligrams once a day with or without food. And this one is a little bit more unique in that it doesn't require dose adjustment in severe hepatic or renal dysfunction. So it doesn't have that qualification that you can only use it in patients with creatinine clearance of greater than 30. Again, relatively well tolerated with headache, fatigue, nausea, and diarrhea most commonly reported. It, like the others, has some major drug interactions to be aware of. Um, but with daclatasvir, it does have dosing adjustments recommended to accommodate for those drug interactions. For patients receiving so strong CYP3A4 inhibitors, we would reduce the dose to 30 milligrams, um, and that would be things like ritonavir and clarithromycin, itraconazole, ketoconazole. For patients receiving moderate CYP3A4 inhibitors, we would increase the dose to 90 milligrams. Um, that would be things like dexamethasone and efavirenz. And then patients that are on strong CYP3A4 inducers, such as some of our anticonvulsants, um, carbamazepine, phenytoin, also rifampin or St. John's wort, we would want to avoid the use of daclatasivir unless we could adjust their other therapy and switch to something um, that doesn't have that interaction. So this table is really just a simplified replication of the one that's in your um, workbook, in, in your chapter. Um, in the chapter, it does include all of the footnotes and some um, alternative therapy options as well. The thing I want you to take away from this table is as we see more um, therapies being approved and studied, we're going to see more therapies added to this table. Currently, the guidelines are very clear that if um, agents are included in the treatment, that it really comes down to choosing the thing that's most appropriate for your specific patient. It could be based on pill burden, on cost, on adverse effects, drug interactions, but they do consider all of the agents for a specific genotype to be relatively equivalent. Um, so there's not a hierarchy of first or second line within this table. For genotype 1A, which is our patient, um, the main stays of therapy are the um, Harvoni combination, which is first on the list, and then simeprevir, sofosbuvir is an option, daclatasvir with sofosbuvir, and then the vicarapac combination um, with ribavirin is the last option. So going back to our patient who had the genotype 1A, um, we could either reassess in 12 months, initiate sofosbuvir with simeprevir, initiate sofosbuvir with letopasvir, or initiate ribavirin and sofosbuvir. All right, I'm seeing a lot of green, so C, um, and I would agree with that. Remember we said with hep C, it's really important to treat patients um, that have evidence of chronic disease. 
um, unless they have a short life expectancy. And our patient doesn't have anything that would indicate that he would have a short life expectancy, so it would be inappropriate to wait to treat him. Um, it, Semeprevir was not really an option for him based on his NS3Q80K polymorphism. We would expect reduced efficacy in him. Um, Sofosbuvir and letopasvir would be our best option. Ribavirin plus sofosbuvir is really only indicated in genotypes 2 or 4, um, so really not genotype specific for his 1A um, hep C. So our last case is a 32-year-old woman with crampy abdominal pain, bloating and constipation for six months. It's not found to be food-related, and she was diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome, constipation predominant, or IBSC. Her labs all come back within normal limits. She doesn't report taking any medications or having any allergies. So we'll determine which of the following therapeutic interventions is best for this patient. Amitriptyline, 50 milligrams a day, VSL number three, which is a probiotic agent, three capsules daily, tegasrod, six milligrams twice a day, or lubiprostone, eight micrograms twice a day. So when we look at irritable bowel syndrome, this really is considered a functional bowel disorder, meaning that we diagnose patients based on the presence of a series of symptoms that are usually GI-related, um, while we also rule out other causes that could be related to the symptoms. Once a patient is diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome, we then would classify them as either being diarrhea predominant or IBSD, constipation predominant, IBSC, or a mixed pattern with a combination or fluctuation between the two main types. The features include a change in frequency or stool appearance that um, may be associated with pain or bloating, and these symptoms generally are alleviated or relieved with defecation. Our main target here is to treat the symptoms that a patient is experiencing as well as underlying comorbidities. When we look at the pharmacologic therapies available, there are several, um, and each of them has their pros and cons. Um, we can also match these with non-pharmacologic therapy, things like beha cognitive behavioral therapy or psychotherapy if a patient has concurrent depression or anxiety as well. Hyoscyamine and dicyclamine are um, options. These are targeted towards pain due to spasm, and they also help treat the diarrhea that's present. Um, they can be used in constipation-predominant IBS. However, they can um, worsen the constipation symptoms, so we usually use them to treat diarrhea instead. They can be used on an as-needed or a scheduled basis, so that makes them um, useful in that respect. Tricyclic antidepressants are useful for the treatment of pain as well as diarrhea symptoms. Again, these have anticholinergic adverse effects, so they can worsen constipation if that's present. Um, so they are generally reserved for IBSD. A lot of patients with IBS have concurrent depression or anxiety. Uh, the doses of the tricyclics that we use for IBS tend to be really low, and so they won't be effective as sole therapy for depression. Um, so we don't generally use these to treat concurrent depression. Uh, however, we do have SSRIs and SNRIs available, and these treat comorbid depression or anxiety, as well as help with symptoms of um, irritable bowel syndrome. They target pain. They often have a promotility action, so they can be helpful in constipation, but they can also be helpful with treating the pain associated with the diarrhea aspects as well. Uh, linaclotide is a guanolate cyclase um, a guanolate cyclase agent, and that helps with the treatment of IBS constipation predominant in adults. It is pregnancy category C, and that's based on some early animal data that we have. Um, lubiprostone is another agent indicated for IBS C, and this is specifically indicated in adult women. Um, this one is the chloride channel activator that works within the GI tract. Its main adverse effect is nausea, so that's something to keep in mind uh, for patients when they're using it. Loperamide can be used as an adjunct agent for IBSD. It really treats the symptom of diarrhea, but it doesn't alleviate any of the pain, so it may be used more as an adjunctive agent rather than a primary therapy. Um, likewise, probiotics have some evidence in IBS, and they really treat some of the other symptoms, things like global symptoms and pain, but they don't alter bowel habits. So again, usually used as an adjunct to um, therapies that really target the bowel habits. Alocitron is something that we've had available that's indicated for IBS diarrhea predominant in women. Um, it does have a risk of ischemic colitis associated with it, so it's only available through a restricted access program. So that might be a limitation to being able to use it. 
Tegaserod is another agent that we've historically had available for um, constipation predominant IBSC. Currently, it um, is associated with cardiovascular risk, and so it's only available through the FDA on an emergency use only basis. So, getting back to our patient to wrap up, um, which of the following therapeutic interventions is best? And considering this patient has IBSC, we can go with amitriptyline, VSL number three, tegaserod six milligrams twice a day, or lubiprostone eight micrograms twice a day. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of D, so I would agree with that. Again, the amitriptyline would be more appropriate in a patient with diarrhea predominant IBS, but may help with the pain aspect. VSL3 could be used as an adjunctive agent, but not as a primary therapy. And then tegaserod would be appropriate. However, it's only available for emergent use. Lubiprostone is really the best option here. Linaclotide could be an alternative option, and that does have once-a-day dosing, um, which may be more appealing to some of our patients. So thank you for your attention, and enjoy the rest of your stay.